The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Um, the first speaker is, uh, is Neil Caps, and he's a technical sales manager of Hydronics, which is uh, a company that measures uh, the uh, microwave moisture measuring for, for uh, production concrete. And uh, he's headquartered in uh, London, England. And most of his his uh, work is done in in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. I guess anywhere other than North America. But uh, so he's going to give us a good product, uh, presentation on the hydronics uh, moisture uh, measuring systems. And I think if you could, I'm going to introduce uh, Neil right now, and he's going to give us our presentation. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, like to welcome you to my presentation. Uh, Hydronics is a worldwide company, which I hope that some of you will be aware of. Um, we do have an office here in the States as well, and I'm here on behalf of our U.S. sales manager, who can't be here at the moment. So I'm going to talk to you today about the the measurement of moisture and the, how critical that is to the process of making concrete. I mean, we all know that concrete is made up of three main raw materials, so the, the aggregates or the filler, including the sand, the cement or a binder, and water to react with the cement and hold it all together. So this mix of materials, or the, the mixed design, is very important, and getting that critical is, or getting that accurate is critical for making self-consolidating concrete, especially because of the the fineness of the uh, tolerances on it. The small errors can cause major problems with the final mix due to the high performance of the, the superplasticizer admixture. So the main problems you get with uh, self-compacting concrete, or self-consolidating concrete, sorry, um, is sort of separation or segregation of the materials in the mix, which occurs because the heavy aggregates can fall through a mix which is too liquid, the lighter materials rise to the surface, and this occurs because the proportions of the different aggregates can change. As you see here, we've got a, a picture of some concrete which has got some fine aggregates mixed in with the larger aggregates to get the correct fill of the mix. You get bleeding, which occurs because of, mainly because of the segregation, where you get the water that rises to the surface of the mix. And this can cause problems with the finish and with curing and cracking of the, the surface finish, which obviously would then need to be reworked for extra costs. And you get other problems which can be caused by the incorrect proportioning of the dry materials and actually getting a different type of concrete than you were expecting. And obviously the, the fine aggregate is not spread evenly throughout the mix, so it fills in the large gaps then that's, that causes problems and can it leave air pockets within the material which can increase the porosity and cause problems with cracking with ice forming. Other problems are overmixing. Um, we'll talk about homogeneity a bit later. Uh, you can mix the concrete for too short or too long a time and this can cause the concrete to become overworked. And obviously, if you put the wrong quantity of admixture in for the amount of moisture that's in that material, then that will cause problems. So why is moisture a problem? 
Well, the main thing is that concrete plants usually batch the raw materials by weight, and water weighs a certain amount. It's nice and easy in kilograms and litres, because one kilogram equals one litre, but I've converted it all to pounds and gallons, or pounds mainly for you, um, because I know that kilograms aren't very well accepted here. But say, for example, you weigh 2,200 pounds of sand, and that's at 3% moisture, you've actually only got 2,136 pounds of that dry sand, and the rest is this water, which is actually absorbed into the, the, the mix of the sand, So how does that effect vary? So if you're weighing, as I say, you've got sand at 3%, then you have this 2,136 pounds. And then if you've got the same sand at 7%, you've only got 2,057. So you've got less aggregate in that weight of material, and that dose of sand. So the main thing this can affect is your proportioning as well as the water going into the mixer, but I'm going to speak about proportioning first. And this is the mix of the different aggregates in your concrete you're, main, you're making. So again, another example. We've got a mix of 2,200 pounds of sand and 1,980 pounds of aggregate. If we take the sand at 3% and the aggregate at 7%, because I'll show two extremes just to show, just to illustrate the point. So you've got 2,136 pounds of sand and 1,850 pounds of aggregate. So your sand to aggregate ratio is 1.15. You've still got this water in there, but I'll come back to that in a little while. If you then change that so that you've got 7% sand and 3% aggregate, you've then only got 2,057 pounds of sand and you've got more aggregate in there. So your aggregate to sand or sand to aggregate ratio is 1.07. And this can cause problems with obviously the, the proportioning of the materials and how the fine materials will fill around the larger aggregates. On top of that, you've also got the effect of the actual moisture. So if we take an example concrete mix now, we're going to put cement, sand and aggregate and water into a mixer. If we take our example, I'm going to make a cubic metre of concrete. So we've got 589 pounds per cubic yard of uh, cement. The sand and aggregate is, wakes up most of the, of the material in the mixer. And then we're going to add 290 pound, 94 pounds of, per cubic yard of water. So if we've got a variation of 1.1% in the sand and aggregates after we correct for that moisture... So this is maybe a moisture test every hour. You might get as good as 1%. It depends on how much you, your sand and aggregates varies in moisture, how well you keep it in the, in the yard. Um, but generally 1% is, is pretty good for offline control. If you've just got an operator that's taking a measurement every hour or every, every few hours. So the water in the aggregates coming in is actually 42 pounds of water in there, which is getting weighed up with the the, 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 the 3,000 pounds worth of sand and aggregates. So if we actually actually look at the actual water in the mix, in the mixer, we've actually got 175 litres we're adding, and you've also got 19 litres which have been gone in with the aggregates. So what we, the bottom line is that we're actually adding 10% extra water into the mixer. If we look at a, an improvement in this moisture control, so we go from taking a measurement every hour to taking an online measurement using moisture equipment, we reckon that you can get down to, uh, you can improve that by 0.8%. You can get down to about 0.2% tolerance on, that, on the moisture in that material. So we're going to use the same mix as before, and now we're going to look at just 0 0.002. So we're just looking at where's only one gallon of water going in with the aggregates. So still the same amount of aggregates, so still 3,000 pounds per cubic yard. And then the water in the mixer is only 2% extra. 
Now, as we said, the small changes in the sand and aggregate moisture give large changes in the final mix, especially with SCC. So this high accuracy is much is, is very important when making this. We can also mention mix homogeneity. If you're measuring moisture in the mixer itself with moisture measurement equipment, then you can then look at the actual accuracy of your mixer, so how well your mixer is mixing. You can record values in the dry mix for control systems, for control purposes, and this can be used to calculate the amount of water to add. And in the wet mix, you can look for homogeneity to show when you've got a good dispersal of the water, and afterwards, if you're adding the admixture during the final, final water phase, then how good the dispersal of that SCC admixture is. And obviously the final mix homogeneity is, is important for the consistency of the final product. So whatever you're making, your, your blocks or your, uh, your forms, um, or your ready mix concrete, then that's obviously the most important part is the quality of your final product. And again, the mix times are important. So mixing until the, until you've got a homogeneous mix is important, but then continuing after you have that homogeneous mix overworks the material and it will make bad concrete. So I'm going to mention a bit about moisture measurement equipment itself. Um, obviously my company markets a range of moisture measurement equipment which the photos in this these slides will indicate. So generally we look to measure in two different locations. The first is in the aggregate and to measure in either in the aggregate bins or on conveyor belts for the bins. So we have some photos of some installations in a bin and under a con under an aggregate bin. And then at the end of a conveyor belt, just showing different ways of, of utilising the sensors. <coughs> Calibration is always important to any process equipment. Um, you calibrate your weigh scales, for example. Um, and it's just as important for the moisture measurement equipment. If you've got good moisture measurement equipment, then the, the calibration process can be very simple. If you've got a linear change in the measuring signal with the moisture change, then you can take various samples of different me um, moistures and you can put that into a table and it's very simple to work out a moisture uh, calibration curve. So the moisture itself is given by the dry weight. That's how we normally recommend. It can be done with wet weight as well, but a lot of people in the world use dry weights. It's the wet mass minus the dry mass divided by the dry mass, which gives us our moisture percentage. We always dry to bone dry because that's a good scientific stop point. We know that the material is bone dry. Um, because when you're heating for the moisture process, the moisture measurement process, the bone dry point is the point at which you can say it's, it, it's scientifically dry or scientifically <coughs> accurate. Uh, good quality equipment doesn't need to be recalibrated. We have systems where they've been installed 10 years without having any problems. We quite often have people who come back to us with a, an old probe and it's just suddenly gone wrong. Uh, we do recommend checking the calibration to check the process is correct. So to give an example of how you'd use this to actually control the, um, the aggregate, uh, one we recommend is weighing a, a, a preset quantity of the aggregate or the sand. You can then use the average moisture material the, of that dose of sand or aggregate and you can then use that to recalculate the target weight. This can then be used to then dose the remaining rate, the remaining weight into the, into the hopper. So as an example of that, so we've got a, a, a an example of this control. If you weigh up 2,200 pounds of sand, for example, you could weigh 75%, so about 1,600. You then read the moisture from the sensor. You can then use your control system to recalculate the target value. So in this instance, we're looking at 5% which is gives us a, a final 
of £2,310. And then you dose the remaining material. So here it's £660. You can then control the water in the mixer. Generally what we'd say is to load the materials in. You measure in the dry mix phase. There's various different ways of using this value. You can then add water to reach a target moisture value. So you can either add the water progressively or you can add the water in one shot. And you can then wet mix and you can decide how long you want to wet mix for depending on the final quality of the concrete. So here's a, a diagram showing this. So we've got the, the, the mixer being loaded and then maybe a pre-wet water addition to bring the materials in there up above the SSD points, the water absorption points. You can then do some pre-wet mixing. Then you can add the cement. You can take a measurement here or at the end of the dry mix time to then give you something to calculate the target water from. And you can then add the water to reach that target value. And then the water gets mixed in and the, sta the signal will stabilise. Once you've got that stable signal, you've then got that good hom homogeneity. So I'm just going to mention about microwave moisture sensors. They're a very cost-effective moisture solution. Uh, other sensors like infrared and uh, other, other uh, sort of capacitive can have different sort of payback times, but the, the infrared tends to be quite expensive and the capacitance tends to be, need a lot of recalibration work. So generally, with using the moisture sensor effectively, you can pay back a sensor and an installation in about three months. And that's based on about 50 cubic meters a day. What would you look for in a moisture sensor? You want something that's rugged and reliable, so a sensor that's been designed for use in the very harsh environment that is concrete. Something that's accurate and easy to calibrate. So you need something which has got a linear response with that water change. This will then give you that accuracy of 0.2%. You need a temperature stable sensor so that you don't have to recalibrate it from winter to summer. And then you want something that's easy to integrate. So 0 to 20 milliamps, 4 to 20 milliamps, maybe 0 to 10 volt, depending on your control system. And then a local presence for training, servicing and supporting your, your probes. And a proven brand. So I just mentioned a little bit about hydronics itself. We've been measuring, or we've been making moisture measurement equipment for the, specifically for the concrete industry for the last 30 years, since 1982. Worldwide, we work in over 65 countries, and we're the industry leader of digital sensors, controls, and the service as well. We always have a focus on sensor technology. The company just does sensors. We don't, we do a, some control equipment, but just to help people use the sensors. So our focus is on researching and developing new sensors, new measurement techniques. So we're continually investing in that research, and we're very focused on our customers. So how do we, how, how do we actually measure the material? We've got some slides here. So basically what you're looking at is the fact that Water itself is a bipolar molecule, so it's got a plus and a minus end. And if you put an electric field across a bucket of water, all of those water molecules will align with that field. If you start changing that electric field, so if you swap reverse it, all of the molecules will then rotate. As you increase the frequency of that change, the molecules will then start to absorb and release energy at different points. And so what we get is if we sweep across a range of frequencies and our sensors are work around 800 to 850 megahertz, we get a signal which is similar to this curve here. And what you used to have, our old sensors before 2000, so we're talking 12 years old and older, uh, tend to fit, measure at a fixed frequency. And this is what we call the analog or the classic me measurement technique. And so as the moisture changes, so F1 and A1 is the first moisture point, you then have F2 and A2, and as you see, the distance from A3 to A2 is a lot less than A1. Whereas if you look at the actual frequency, it's a fixed frequency for each shift for each one. 
This means that the measurement of the moisture for the older sensors was a curve which made it very difficult to calibrate because each sensor would have a slightly different curve. You needed to know which curve you were, you were using. The new sensors basically are this linear line here. And as you can see, the difference in the error is quite large. So we're looking at this digital multi-frequency technique, which is our, this is the way our reading is derived. So as you see, it's very simple to calibrate the sensors because all you need to do is to find two or possibly more points on this line and you then can define that line. And our software helps to do this. So to make our sensors easy to use, one of the other things we do is to preset the 0 and the 100 value of the sensor. So we set it so that it reads 0 in air and in water it reads 100. And due to this, each sensor that comes out of our factory is pre-set with these values, which means that they're very simple if there is a problem to swap a sensor for another sensor uh, without having to recalibrate, without having to recalibrate any recipes or any bin sensors. We've got some slightly new techniques which have been put into our latest revisions of the sensors. So some of the, the these graphs show some raw mix of sensor traces from our latest products. And you can see that the noise from this, this is our standard mode, which is just uses the frequency, is there's quite a lot of noise on it, which would mean you'd have to put processing in to filter that out. If we then look at our new, one of our new modes, which is our, what we call mode V, this has much less noise from the mixing blades. And this reduces the amount of post-processing or the amount of signal processing needed in the sensor. The sensors all contain very advanced signal processing features and some of the new features are even better than our older sensors, which further improve the signal from the sensor here you can see some traces from a raw signal, is the blue signal in the background, which then goes through some filtering to give the, the light blue, and then a smoothing filter which gives the yellow signal. Now our latest sensor also has something called a DSP, or a digital signal processor, which actually gives the green signal, which as you see rises to the desired point a lot faster, it gives you a lot more information about what's in the mixer. Just to quickly run over with our latest control solution. This is for controlling just the water into the mixer. It's designed to work either as a retrofit for an existing plant or as a, an addition to another control system. And it's basically designed to produce consistent high quality batches in an automatic way. It can cope with a lot of different recipes of concrete. Basically, we say that you, with this, with moist, mixer moisture control generally, you can get to plus or minus 0.1% moisture. So in conclusion, so if you control the moisture in your aggregates and you control the water addition into your mixer, you can reduce the number of wasted batches, the number of um, modified batches. So the solution to this is by using very quality, or quality moisture measurement system with bin sensors and mixer systems, and then using a water control system in the mixer itself. And thank you.